All right, people, Mr. Wright here with lesson number four for the horn in F. We're going to be talking about the single horn in F and the double horn in F and B flat. There's a trigger that you press and it changes it from the F side to the B flat. It's one set of valves, but this extra thumb trigger on the double horn swaps it over to where you use the plumbing for the shorter valves, putting the instrument in the key of B flat. But first of all, let's talk about the single horn. If you're a middle school player, most likely your school has a single horn, an F, and your director would maybe uh, change you over from the trumpet to the French horn. Sometimes I've started students directly on the French horn, and that always works great too. But when you get your case, you want to make sure that the label is facing straight up. I've got mine on a piano bench right now, a padded piano bench, and I'm kind of cradling it between my knees right here so it doesn't slide off. These horn cases are, are typically, they're kind of shaped like this, so they slide off of uh, tables and things like that, so it's best to put it on the floor. But uh, So that you can see things better, I've got it up here. And I'm gonna unlatch the three latches. Usually every case has three latches or a zipper system. But uh, I'm opening it up, and of course we've already used the uh, mouthpiece in earlier lessons, some buzzing notes to get control over our embouchure, to get those, those, uh, the mouthpiece mechanics down. But I'm going to set this down first right now. And uh, I keep rags in the bell of the instrument so I can wipe it off when I'm finished. But we're going to pick up the instrument. I'm going to turn it up a little bit so you can see. I'm going to grab it right here underneath the valves and lift it straight out. And then I'm just going to bring it close to my belly to kind of protect it. I'm going to get the mouthpiece out. I'm going to set it right inside the lead pipe or the mouthpiece receiver, some people like to call it. And I'm going to close this case and get it out of the way. All right. All right. Okay. So the way you'll hold your horn, um, and let me say this first. We first of all want to set our tuning slides. Uh, every time I pack up a, an instrument, I like to push all the tuning slides in. That way, the tuning slides don't get rusted in place. If you move them every single day, they don't have a chance to. Now, a repair technician will say that these tuning slides have frozen. It didn't, it's just a trade term they use, but it really means rusted in place from the oxidation that takes place. So I'm moving this uh, first, this main tuning slide out almost a half an inch. Kind of depends, you know, when you use a tuner, you can get tuner apps on your phone, or you can buy a tuner at the store, usually about 20 bucks. So I've moved that one out almost a half an inch. And then I'm gonna press down my first uh, rotor valve lever right here, this little paddle right here, and I'm gonna pull out my, at the same time, I'm gonna pull out this first tuning slide about a quarter of an inch. This middle one right here, I'll move it a little bit just to give it its little movement for the day. And then I'm gonna press down my third valve right here to relieve the, see, it would be a vacuum in here. If I started pulling it, it would create a vacuum inside this uh, this tube right here, which could cause it to collapse a little bit and then it'll get all stuck and messy. So we don't want that. You always want to press down the corresponding uh, valve for the tuning slide that you're pulling in or out. All right, so I've got that one set about a quarter of an inch out. So I think we're ready to go. The way you'll hold the horn is uh, you'll put your, your you see this little uh, hoop right here, this little hook, you'll set your thumb in there and your pinky in this next ring right here, this hook right here on this end. And of course, you just drape your hands over like that, your left hand over there to play these valves as such. For the right hand, pretend that you're swimming. You know, your hand's slightly cupped like that, like you've got your hand like this, or you're at a beauty pageant, you're waving. And, uh, but you're gonna set your hand in the bell like this so that you could support that bell if you were standing up. So you're up like this and it's just resting right there you're not closing it off it's just it's just up and out of the way and this is uh this right hand has a twofold purpose part of it is to support the instrument to kind of stabilize it so it doesn't slide it because a lot of times when we're playing most of the time when we're, we're sitting down uh we've got it bounced on our, our our thigh but it's also good to have that support there too uh, especially as you're wiggling valves it's good to just have that right hand in place to help stabilize the instrument Another thing is you can use your right hand to, 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 your hand really is an extension of the horn. You can use it to adjust the intonation of different notes. If it's a little bit sharp, you can kind of pull your hand down and it will lower the pitch of that, that note down. So you've, it's a crucial part. Like for instance, let me play uh, just a low C, 
this note right there. Uh, it's it's open. It's just the most when you play with a relaxed embouchure, uh, it's the most uh, the note that comes out the easiest, I think. But here's just a low C. Now I'm gonna take my hand and pull it down that way to basically make the instrument a little bit longer and bring the pitch down a little bit. And at the same time, I'm also gonna kind of drop my tongue a little bit lower. Now I won't move my tongue at all. I'm just gonna keep my embouchure completely still. So you can bring the pitch down uh, you can actually play different little half steps and such and to play different tune just with your right hand. So, uh, but that's, that's basically how you hold the single horn. And if I were going to play a scale uh, on it, I'm going to play this C scale right here. The, the vowel combination is super easy in the beginning. Uh, your low open C, that note that I was just playing, open C, open, first, open, first, open. And this is what I call, you'll, you'll see later on uh, uh, in the next lessons, that's what I call the five note walk up. It's a little thing I just kind of came up with to help me find my starting pitches when I was playing in like a community orchestra or when I'm playing with a band. Uh, during the last piece when everybody's clapping, I'll kind of do this little walk up. I'll go. And say it starts on the next, uh, the next, the song starts on an A with vowels one or two. All right, so. It just helps me to get a, a reference so I can I know. Now some horn players, they have perfect pitch, they just can hear the tip, but I'm not that way. I only have relative pitch. So I'll do my little five note walk up again. It's just open first, open first, open. C, D, E, F, G. Just walking straight up right here. The, uh, and I just took it on up to the C right here, just the, so this is a complete C scale. Of course the horn in F, transposes down a fifth. So I played the C scale, but what actually came out is a fifth lower, The is actually concert F. Concert pitch means it's just the actual pitch you're actually hearing. So it'd be this, if it was bass clef down here, <clears throat> excuse me, it'd be this F down here. It's transposing down a fifth down into the bass clef. I didn't write a bass clef there, sorry. But that's the single horn, and a lot of times in middle school, you'll start off with this horn, or just when you start, it's a, it's a great horn to start off with, but when you get into the really high registers, uh, nailing those high notes are difficult because this tubing is so long that all the partials become really, really close together. So uh, to solve this problem, they came up with a double horn where they have an extra set. There's a trigger right here that sends the, the, uh, this, that uses these same rotors, but they're longer. And uh, there's an other section of the rotors that opens up tubing that's shorter than these long slides. So this is the, the single horn. It's great to start off with, but when you get into really high notes, it's hard to be accurate. Some people can play it all through high school, but it's tough, all right? So, but this is the, the single horn. Let me set this down, and I'll just lay it right here. And then I'm gonna grab the horn. Uh, my, my son, I swapped him over from trumpet over to this little horn right here. This is a school horn. And when you, maybe your band director moves you from trumpet to French horn, don't just go out and buy one. You know, they'll probably, he'll have a school-owned instrument, most likely. And uh, so you don't want to go out and buy one. You want to kind of play, and uh, you, you might just all through your uh, middle school and high school experience just play school-owned horns, and that's great. Um, but if you ever decide to buy one, uh, it's a huge investment. This one is a, a Holton. It's the uh, Philip Farkas uh, went in with Holton and designed this one, the, the Farkas model, Holton Farkas model. It's a great horn. Um, it's a little bit more of a controlled sound, whereas all the Con, this is a Con 14D single horn, uh, but the, they have a Con 8D, the Constellation, which is a fantastic horn that a lot of orchestral players use. Uh, it has it, the, the bore size, the, the, the size of the, inner, the tubes inside, it's really large and it's just this really free blowing instrument. Also on all the con models that I've played, uh, I've played an 8D before, one of my students had one. The valves, paddles right here, they kind of extend up pretty high and um, it's just a different feel through here so you gotta get used to it. They have really good valves. They're always really, really reliable, solid valves. 
Uh, I love them. They, but I love it. It's just a huge, powerful sound. But some, not everybody wants that. Some people like, like Philip Farkas, he wanted a more controlled sound. And uh, so he, he was a Holton guy. He liked the Holton uh, concept, but he made some tweaks and he came up with this model of an instrument. But my son played this uh, horn all through school. And uh, to get this in tune, you've got your tuning slide back here. These are, uh, you've got two tuning slides back here now. Uh, this one right here, got it out about a quarter of an inch, and this other one right here, about almost a half an inch. And notice I talked to you about the single horn, these longer um, tuning slides here associated with those rotor valves. On the double horn, the rotor valve is just longer, and it has uh, two different sets of holes that open up as you press these paddles right here, these, these rotors. Um, Say I, if I want to press down the, the rotor, the thumb trigger right here, it swaps it from the F valves, the F slides right here, to the shorter valves back here. Let me go ahead and just pull the slides out of the F side, these long ones right here, so that you can see these shorter ones back here. Note this first valve slide is much shorter, and of course this middle valve slide is very short, and this one's very short compared to, to this honking thing, all right? So the, it, when you press down this thumb trigger, it changes you to the shorter valves, which means all the partials way up high become further apart. It makes it easier to hit them. If you're going, uh, right? It just makes it easier to hit those notes or, I shouldn't be playing so loud, it's probably distorting the uh, microphone. Sorry about that. I should play softer. Let me do it softer. Okay. It just makes it so much easier. Some of those notes, and as you go up to the F and the G above that, I'm talking about notes that are right up in here. It's harder to hit those notes uh, with a longer tubing. Um, we can get into that more later. But I'm going to put this back together. And when you're oiling or lubricating these tuning slides, uh, what I'll do is I'll take the the F side out and put it over in one place, the B flat tuning slides in another little spot. You don't want to get them mixed up. For instance, these are longer, obviously. Even the middle slide, notice how long he is. And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm pressing down the thumb trigger and the middle valve at the same time so I don't have a vacuum here. Notice the difference. Here's the F side and here's the B flat side. So it's, it's a, it's a sh shorter little uh, tuning slide for sure. And but I'm gonna put this back in place and put all these guys back in so I can show you a little bit more. And I'm pressing down this first out without the trigger. Um, and, and typically I like to press down, I keep the middle slide pretty much almost all the way in. All right, we're ready to go. Now, so I've shown you, basically you hold this instrument the very same way. It's gonna be heftier, it's a heavier instrument. It's two instruments in one, the, B, the F side and then the B flat side. And um, so to empty this one out, let me show you, ex explain to you how to empty this out. Say you've got, later on you're gonna have a band piece and say you might have a four measure rest somewhere towards the middle. Uh, what you'll do is I'll take my mouthpiece out, I'll lay it, you know how your pants kind of bunch up right there or somewhere, or lay your mouthpiece somewhere where it's not going to fall off into the floor and go ding, 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 and during the middle of a concert. You don't want that. So I'll, I'll lay it someplace right up in here and I'll just, uh, I'll take this, I'm going to press every single valve I've got down. I'm going to push, push a thumb, one, two, three, and then I'm going to roll towards this lead pipe here or the mouthpiece receiver, whatever you want to call it. So I'm going to roll it this way and I've not played this much, with a little bit of condensation. And that's not saliva or spit. That is condensation. Even in the mouthpiece, uh, it's, it's just condensation. Uh, there's very little saliva, unless you kind of just drool randomly. Yeah, it's, it's not saliva, okay? Unless you're a drooler. But uh, it's just it's condensation, even in the mouthpiece, like I said. But I'm gonna press down every uh, rotor that I've got and I'm going to just let it roll towards the lead pipe and then I'm going to let it continue to roll and I'm going to turn around this way so you can see and what I did right then it, it, it rolled around this way and there might be some here yep there was some right there you don't have to check this because it's not rolled into that spot right there 
So I'm gonna, and I don't have to press down any uh, key because this is all open right here. And then, because I pressed down my thumb trigger, it's gonna, it sent it a lot of this condensation throughout all these tubes and the way I rolled it, it's gonna send it to this inside B-flat third valve slide. So I'll press down the third one of the, the F side just to get it out of the way because there's not anything in there usually because it went to the, the B-flat side because I was pressing down my thumb trigger. I've emptied all this stuff into this one slide right here. Uh, I've not been playing this much, but yeah, there's a little bit in there. Okay, surprise. All right, so I'm gonna put this back together and I, I'll lift off my thumb trigger so I don't have any compression here on this tuning slide. All right, and I'm good to go. And so you want to plan out times in your music when you can empty out all this plumbing, because uh, that's that's a struggle, especially if it's a if it's a cool room and you're blowing warm air into this cold tubing, uh, you're going to have a lot of condensation. It's just the nature of the horn, but uh, you learn to deal with it and cope with it and kind of flow along and, and get it get it emptied out in the right time. Uh, neat thing about the French horn or the horn and F is that in, as you get into higher literature, or even middle school literature, there's a lot of horn solos. Composers love to give horn solos. Uh, for the brass, I would say it's the, you know, you'll get more solos in the horn section than, or as the first horn player, than any other brass section. They just love the sound of the horn. But, uh, so again, you're gonna be playing uh, thumb right here, and make sure you have, uh, just make sure you're sitting up straight and you want to practice to play with poise and beauty and develop with your director a reputation that you're going to play it beautifully, uh, very carefully. So you want to practice to make all of your sounds gorgeous. Remember the basics of your embouchure, spread the teeth and lips, ah, to where it's like that. And you're going to use two thirds upper lip, one third upper, uh, lower lip, and uh, drop your tongue to the bottom of your mouth when you're playing low notes. And, uh, uh, firm up your lips to the, against the teeth for higher notes. Never pinch to get a, a nasty sound. Have your, your, your teeth and lips still spread apart. You're just firming up the, the lips against the teeth. Faster airstream to where you can play soft in the high register. Like a... And begin each note with the tongue. If you, a lot of times, like then, I was just blowing... I, I really didn't use the tongue properly. Um, but if you use a tongue, it'll get that air string going and excite that vibration going on with the lips. Learn how to use uh, vibrato tastefully. And, um, but if you just create this this uh, reputation, a culture of you're gonna play beautiful solos. When the director comes across a piece that has a beautiful French horn solo, he's gonna say, hey, I got a guy who can handle that, or a lady, a girl that can handle that. So you wanna be that person, all right, to kind of create opportunities for yourself. Yeah, like I said, if you're, uh, you're playing different school-owned uh, instruments, just so you can get a feel of, wow, I, I like the the Con 8D, oh, I, 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 the uh, what's another one that's out there? The Hans Hoyer. I've seen a lot of those at all district band clinics and at honors band clinics. Uh, a little bit more pricey, around the six thousand dollar range. This one, the Holton Farkas, around four thousand. But I was able to; it was used. I got it for three thousand. Uh, sometimes you can get horns used, but uh, before you go out and buy a horn, say you're like in in high school, maybe, and you're wanting, to, maybe you're taking private lessons. Uh, you know, before you go out and buy, or say you're gonna think about going and playing in college even, uh, even if you're not a music major, uh, see if you can get a lesson with a, uh, a horn professor at a college close by and uh, get their take on it. Uh, but you wanna try different instruments, different horns. The Yamaha Corporation, they've got a, a great uh, double horn. But there's, different, there's differences, okay? but you, you want to see which one works best for you and uh, the, the way that you play your embouchure, the size of your lips. Uh, of course, like I've, I've got large lips. Uh, I'm playing um, a Schilke 32, which I think is the largest mouthpiece they make. On trumpet, I play a 1C, which is a big trumpet mouthpiece. On my bass trombone, I like to play a 1G. 
So, you know, you're not going to be probably playing the same kind of mouthpiece I am. But you want to just try different mouthpieces. A lot of times band directors will have an assortment of, of mouthpieces that you can try. Just to sanitize it and give it a spin and try that. I'm going to do a separate video on how to restring the rotors. These are all connected by strings back here. And uh, those sometimes wear out. Well, they will wear out eventually. So um, I restring it. What I do is before my concerts, I will go through all my French horn players' horn. I'll just open up their case, look inside, and, and make sure all the strings are in good condition, that everything's moving. Uh, that there's no. Sometimes I'll just go ahead and oil all their valves for them. And uh, if I see a, a string that's frayed, I'll just restring it. But I'll, I'll do the, uh, the, the rotor restringing video separately because that's a whole different thing there's going to have to be a lot of close-ups and you can probably find uh, rotor restringing youtube videos out there already anyway so we'll see about that but uh, i do want to show you real briefly how to oil your valves for instance say if i want to order uh, oil this first valve slide i'm going to pull that one out and uh, i keep all of my uh, oil and slide grease in a Ziploc bag so that in case it leaks out, it doesn't get all inside of my case. Um, rotor valve oil, not valve oil, but rotor valve oil. And um, it's got a stem on here so that you can hopefully aim that stem, like turn the horn this way, and then I'm gonna set it so it doesn't hit, so that the oil doesn't uh, rinse any debris that might be in this tuning slide down into the rotor. Because if you do that, if you rinse down some kind of gunk or even grease or whatever, it will cause the valve to kind of uh, stick up a little bit, be kind of, you can, you can just feel it. So you don't want that. You want it to make sure that it just hits only down right at the, the valve. And uh, one thing I like to do, I've got one inside my bag, I'll get a coffee stirrer, just a little tiny coffee stirrer, and I'll set this over here. Then I'll, I'll sit it down and I'll put it, the, um, the straw right up here toward the rotor so it does i know for sure it's not gonna you gotta make sure that this doesn't scrape the side of the tubing though and but uh, i'll put that in there to get the the oil straight to the rotor without washing any debris into that rotor making it stick and let's see here also when i'm ready to i'll wipe this off with a cloth that i've got in here and then i'll take my tuning slide grease about once a month Rotor, you want to oil your rotors about uh, once every week and a half, about every uh, 10 days or so, sometimes uh, seven days if you're playing a lot. Uh, but I'll wipe the tuning slide, uh, wipe this off. Remember, I'll set my slides for the F side over here, B flat over there, or whichever way you want to do. But I'll take this this tuning slide grease and I'll squirt a little bit on here. It's, it's really thick and gummy. Um, and I'll spread it out with my hands, then I'll just simply put it back in place. And I'll do all of them at once. I'll do the, these right here uh, for the rotors, and then I'll also uh, lubricate the, the tuning slides that are on the back as well. And there's another one, usually on models, uh, there's one right here on the uh, Holton model, but on some other models, this doesn't come out. There's, there's different uh, designs that different companies use, but it's good to have this to where this comes out though, so that you can get uh, access to particularly the, the thumb trigger as far as oiling it. As soon as you're finished with your instrument, uh, like I said, I have these two wiping cloths and anywhere where my hand has uh, touched, uh, first of all, I'm going to empty out the horn. You know, I just press all my triggers, take the mouthpiece out, press all my triggers down, empty it out really good. Uh, make sure it's all clean like that. And then I'll push in all of my tuning slides and then I will take these two cloths in my hands and just wipe down the instrument. So, because your hands, um, you have salt and oils that are corrosive to this finish. And, but if you wipe it off, this finish will last a much, much longer time. So you wanna take care of it just anywhere, like where your hand was rubbing inside the bell, just wipe out, just get any kind of moisture off of it, dry it out. And so that there's, you don't want a whole lot of moisture in a dark case. And about once every two years, it's a good idea to take your instrument to have it, uh, it's what's called a sonic clean. It's where they take all the slides out, take everything out, and then they set everything down in a, um, a, a this vat of chemicals, and it, it does some little zzz, <laughs> and it cleans it out completely, and you'll feel like you got a brand new horn. And it's just so clean. Uh, all your tuning slides, there's no grit or grime, because uh, even if you 
get a little bit of, of oil down this tuning side here, it's not going to mess up your valve. It's just so clean. And uh, it's good, good to do that every once in a while. About every two years is a good uh, rule of thumb to follow. Remember, you want to uh, develop just a beautiful uh, singing tone on the horn to where it's delicate and beautiful, yet powerful in places. Um, so it's a majestic instrument. I love the horn. And uh, so I enjoy it. It's, it's got a different kind of a place in the brass ensemble. You've got these powerful trumpets that can also play soft. And they, everybody needs to be able to play with great dynamic range. But uh, the horn has this veiled, uh, beautiful sound that a lot of composers love to bring out. But I pray God will be with you as you, uh, you begin this journey on the horn.